Good morning, Your Honours. This is the case number IT0142A, the prosecutor versus Pavle Struga. Thank you, Madam Registrar. I would like to know if Mr. Strugar is able to hear the proceedings and follow them in a language which he understands. I'm not receiving interpretation. Si vous voulez bien reprendre, Monsieur Struga. Could you repeat what you just said, Mr. Strugar? The appellant's microphone is off. Well, I know that Mr. Strugar is able to hear and follow the proceedings in a language which he understands. Proceedings now. Pardon? Da. Yes, I can follow the proceedings now. Thank you, Mr. Strugar. I will now ask the parties to introduce themselves, beginning, please, with the defense for Mr. Strugar. Good morning, Your Honors. Mr. Struga's defense is represented by Mr. Goran Rodic from Podgorica and Mr. Vladimir Petrovic from Belgrade. Thank you. Nous remercions la défense. À présent, je me. Thank you, counsel. I will now turn my attention to the office of the prosecutor. Good morning, Your Honours. Helen Brady appearing on behalf of the prosecution, together with Michelle Jarvis. Laurel Baig and our case manager Sebastian Van Hoydonk. Nous remercions le procureur. La présente audience. Thank you. Today's hearing concerns the case of the prosecutor versus Pavle Strugar. As indicated in the scheduling order of 18 June 2008, the Appeals Chamber is sitting today to pronounce its judgment in this case in accordance with Article 15 bis of the statute and Rule 117d of the Rules of Procedure and Evidence of the Tribunal. In accordance with the Tribunal practice, I will not read out the text of the judgment with the exception of its disposition. After recalling the principal issues raised in the context of these proceedings, I will present the conclusions of the Appeals Chamber. I should like to point out that the following summary is not an integral part of the judgment. The only authoritative account of the Appeals Chamber's findings and of its reasons for those findings is to be found in the written judgment, copies of which shall be made available to the parties at the end of this hearing. The events giving rise to these appeals took place during the military campaign conducted by the troops of the former Yugoslav People's Army, the JNA, in the region of Dubrovnik, Croatia, in October, November, and December 1991. According to the judgment rendered on 31st January 2005 by Trial Chamber 2, in the context of an attack on Serj ordered by Strugar, the 3rd Battalion of the 472nd Motorized Brigade 
shelled the old town of Dubrovnik. The trial chamber concluded that these units were subordinated to the second operational group, the second OG, of which General Strugar assumed command on 12 October 1991. The chamber considered that this shelling was deliberate, that it was not a response at Croatian or other military positions, actual or believed, and that it had caused considerable damage to the old town. It further found that the shelling of the old town killed two and injured two, and that none of the victims were actively par taking part in the hostilities. On that basis, the trial chamber convicted Struger to a single sentence of eight years imprisonment for the following counts. Count three, attack on civilians under articles three and seven three of the statute. Count six, destruction or willful damage done to cultural property under Articles 3D and 7.3 of the statute. Both parties appealed the trial judgment. At the request of the parties, the appeals chamber accepted the withdrawal of these appeals on 20 September 2006, and then the reopening of appeals proceedings on 7 June 2007. Mr. Strugar requests the Appeals Chamber to acquit him of all counts against him, or, in the alternative, to order a new trial, or substantially reduce the sentence imposed upon him. He also requests the Appeals Chamber to stay the judicial proceedings concerning him, as a result of the fact that he was and remains unfit to stand trial. The prosecution requests the dismissal of all grounds of appeal put forth by Strugar and raises three grounds of appeal in which it alleges errors of law and of fact concerning the scope of Strugar's duty to prevent the illegal shelling of the old town and errors in relation to cumulative convictions and to sentencing. Before reviewing the grounds of appeal, it is appropriate to recall briefly the standards for appellate review. Appeals against judgments are of a corrective nature and are not trials de novo. Accordingly, Article 25 of the statute provides that the role of the appeals chamber is limited to correcting errors of law in validating a decision and errors of fact which have occasioned a miscarriage of justice. As regards errors of fact, it is established jurisprudence that the appeals chamber will not lightly overturn findings of fact made by a trial chamber. Consequently, the appeals chamber will overturn these findings only where no reasonable trier of fact could have reached the same finding, or where the finding is wholly erroneous. As for the determination of the sentence, the appeals chamber will not revise a sentence unless the trial chamber has committed a discernible error in the exercise of its broad discretion or has failed to follow the applicable law. The appeals chamber may immediately dismiss the arguments of a party which do not have the potential to cause the impugned decision to be reversed or revised and need not consider them on the merits. 
Finally, it is appropriate to recall that the appeals chamber has the inherent discretionary power to determine which arguments merit a reasoned opinion in writing and will thus dismiss without detailed consideration the arguments which are evidently unfounded. I will now move to the review of the grounds of appeal raised by the parties. The Appeals Chamber first decided to review Strugar's fifth ground of appeal, in which he alleges that he is unfit to stand trial, since allowing that ground could render the other grounds of appeal moot. In its decision of 26 May 2004, the Trial Chamber found that the issue of fitness to stand trial is one which, although undoubtedly connected with the physical and mental condition of the accused, was not confined to establishing whether a given disorder was present, but was better approached by determining whether the accused was able to exercise his rights effectively in the proceedings against him. After analyzing the arguments of the parties in this respect and the numerous relevant legal authorities, the Appeals Chamber finds that the Trial Chamber did not err by defining the standard applicable to the determination of fitness to stand trial. In fact, the test for such a determination must be that of rational participation, which allows the accused to exercise his right to a fair trial, such that he is able to participate effectively in his trial and have an understanding of the basic procedural matters. Next, the Appeals Chamber also agrees with the Trial Chamber's application of the legal standard to the facts in the present case. More specifically, and in light of the conclusions above, the Appeals Chamber shares the view of the Trial Chamber that the report prepared by the defense expert wrongly set the level of understanding too high for assessing fitness to stand trial by arguing in particular that the accused must have the capacity to understand fully the conduct of the court proceedings and the evidence in order to mount a genuine defense. The Bill's Chamber notes that a distinction must be made between the fitness to stand trial and the capacity to conduct one's own defense. Regarding Struger's claims to the trial chamber that his overall health condition was not taken into account, the Appeals Chamber considers that the Trial Chamber correctly noted that a diagnosis was not sufficient in itself to determine whether or not a person was fit to stand trial. Consequently, rather than examine each suspected or ascertained illness afflicting the accused at the time, it correctly focused its analysis on the conclusions and remarks concerning the accused's capacity in connection with the effective exercise of his rights. In light of the evidence of the case as a whole, the Appeals Chamber upholds the findings of the Trial Chamber that Strugar understood the nature of the charges against him, the conduct of the court proceedings, and the evidence in detail, 
and could testify and give instructions to his counsel. Consequently, the appeals chamber finds that Struger, admittedly suffering from a certain number of mental and somatic disorders, was fit to stand trial since he was assisted by qualified counsel. As a result, the fifth ground of appeal raised by Struger is dismissed in its entirety. We will now examine the first and third grounds of appeal in which Struger argues that the trial chamber committed a certain number of factual errors. Firstly, the appeals chamber dismisses without detailed consideration several of Struger's arguments concerning the details of combat operations conducted by the JNA in the region of Dubrovnik in October and November 1991, because they are evidently unfounded. As regards the argument according to which the trial chamber erred in finding that the mens rea needed to establish his responsibility as a superior under Article 7.3 of the statute was satisfied, the appeals chamber is of the opinion that it was reasonable for the trial chamber to find that Admiral Jokic had conducted an investigation into the events of November 1991 and that Struger was aware of the shelling of the old town of Dubrovnik in October and November 1991. Consequently, this claim is rejected. Secondly, as regards the alleged errors in connection with the events of 3 and 5 December 1991, the Appeals Chamber dismisses, without providing detailed reasons, Struger's arguments concerning the conduct of negotiations with the Croatian ministers. The role played by Admiral Jokic in the events of 5 December 1991 the military realities of the JNA and the testimony of Lieutenant Colonel Jovanovic, because they're evidently unfounded. As regards the order to attack Serj, the Appeals Chamber finds that Struger failed to demonstrate that the trial chamber's findings were unreasonable. In particular, he failed to demonstrate how the trial chamber's failure to clarify the content of the order to attack Serj affected his conviction or sentence. The exact content of this order does not affect the trial chamber's findings that Struger ordered this attack. Had the material ability to prevent and put an end to the shelling of the old town, and had the means to communicate with his subordinates during the attack. The appeals chamber also finds that Struger has failed to demonstrate that the trial chamber's appreciation of the testimonies of Colm Doyle and Colonel Svechevich was unreasonable. Consequently, this claim is rejected. Thirdly, considering the alleged errors with respect to the events of 6 December 1991, the Appeals Chamber dismisses, without detailed consideration, Struger's arguments concerning the testimony of Frigate Captain Hanjiev and the owners of the buildings damaged in the old town because they are evidently unfounded. The Appeals Chamber further considers that Struger has failed to demonstrate that the trial chamber's findings concerning the reports prepared by Admiral Jokic and Captain Nesic, the Croatian firing positions 
all. The presence of Croatian heavy weapons in the old town on 6 December 1991 and the report of expert witness Janko Vilicic were unreasonable. As regards Struger's conversation with General Kadijevic, the appeals chamber finds that Struger has failed to demonstrate that no reasonable trier of fact could have reached the same findings as the trial chamber. In particular, that he was aware of the clear and strong risk that the artillery was repeating its previous conduct and committing similar offenses. As regards the trial chamber's finding that it is highly unlikely that he did not receive reports on the attack on the old town, the appeals chamber is of the opinion that the trial chamber reasonably established that the second OG had the fundamental organizational structure needed to control combat operations and that it received combat reports from the units directly subordinated to it. Moreover, the trial chamber established with reason and support the numerous ways in which Strugar could have obtained information about the attack on Surge. Finally, as regards the status of Mato Valialo and Ivo Vlasica, the appeals chamber considers that a reasonable trier of fact could have found beyond a reasonable doubt that in his capacity as a driver for the Dubrovnik municipal crisis staff, Mato Valialo was not actively taking part in the hostilities when he was injured. Furthermore, although it would have been preferable for the trial chamber to have done so more explicitly, the appeals chamber is of the opinion that the trial chamber has established beyond a reasonable doubt that at that time, Mato Valialo and Ivo Vlasica were civilians.